can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Peter Bolt of CampJefferson.com. It's not the camp that you think of, but they help brands grow. And we'll go into that. But Peter, um, I always like to mention other episodes people would should check out of the podcast. And I'll formally introduce you in a second. Um, you know, since uh, Peter hails from Toronto, uh, I had John Warlow. Uh, he wrote the book Built to Sell. He's got a great podcast and he talks about selling businesses, valuations, and everything in between. So check that episode out. Um, I also had on Jason Swank. Uh, Jason was on two times. One, he built in, uh, built up his agency to over eight figures and sold it. And then the second one was how he's been buying up agencies. He also runs a great agency group. Um, and he also talks about kind of how they've been and why they've been uh, building up and buying agencies. So check those out and more on inspiredinsider.com. And this episode is brought to you by uh, Rise25. And at Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships and partnerships. And how do we do that? We actually uh, help you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. We do the uh, full accountability, the strategy, and the execution. So Peter, we call ourselves the magic elves that work in the background to make it look easy for the host and the company so they could just focus on their business and building relationships and creating amazing content. So, you know, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I have found no better way over the past decade than to profile the people and companies I most admire and share with the world what they're working on. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, you can go to rise25.com or email us at support at rise25.com. And we have some really cool things in store from you uh, for from Camp Jefferson. They have some, they work with some amazing brands and they really have, they will talk about um, how people, how they market brands and some of the best practices, some of the mistakes people make and everything in between. Peter Bolt has worked 20 plus years in the world of marketing and advertising in Canada and the US. He's been a part of starting and building multiple successful agencies. He's helped lead the growth of Camp Jefferson into a successful and thriving agency with over $6 million in annual revenue and more. And most importantly, happy staff. And we're going to talk about what they do with employee engagement. Peter, thanks for joining me. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. So Peter, just start off and tell people about Camp Jefferson. And I think you were formerly known as as Dare. So Correct. talk about the brand change. Why Camp Jefferson? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, the brand change is primarily due to ownership structure change. But we we started off as Dare. Uh, Dare was a pretty well known agency in the throughout Europe, uh, out mainly out of the UK. Uh, they wanted to expand into the North American market, and we created Dare Toronto. Uh, after a few years together, carrying on, we uh, we went through an ownership change. The North, uh, a new owner came in, bought the North American assets, and as we separated from there, we had to find a, a new name because they uh, ended up uh, maintaining that name over in Europe, uh, and hence Camp Jefferson uh, came to be. So, how did you come up with the name Camp Jefferson? How did that come about? <laughs> That's a good story. So. At that time, we had an office in Vancouver, uh, and we were uh, handling some off uh, some accounts in Toronto and Vancouver that were kind of you know deemed to be in the same category, a little bit uh, in category, um, even conflicting a little. So we needed to have names that connected the two offices, but were kind of seen as somewhat unique, uh, you know, at least in the clients' minds who we consulted during the process and. When we named ourselves Camp Jefferson uh, for the street we lived on here in Toronto, uh, the Vancouver office was named Camp Pacific uh, for obvious reasons. And that that level of kind of connection, but distinctiveness was uh, kind of split the middle between uh, that that made clients happy and us happy. And that's that's where we ended up. So, Peter, talk more about what you do. What does the company do? 
You know what? I think at our core, we help we help our clients grow their businesses and their brands. Uh, you know, now how we do that is is through a, a bunch of different ways and what we execute, but that's at our core. Um, you know, what else is at our core and what we do believe drives that growth or helps us drive that growth is understanding choice. Uh, we talk a lot about designing choice. And really what's at the core of that is understanding why people are choosing you or are not choosing you and choosing one of your competitors. And as we can understand that and dissect what motivates that and what's affecting that choice, we then can kind of take that to and express and build things that are going to help impact that choice. Uh, sometimes and oftentimes that results in communication campaigns and ad campaigns. Other times it means we, we learn that, you know, people aren't choosing you because your packaging is not coming off the shelf. So we'll help them redesign your packaging or that their website is not easy to kind of work with. So we'll rebuild their website. So the outputs vary, Jeremy, but the goal and the motivation or the, the kind of path to get there is pretty common on understanding people's motivations, behaviors, and how that results and impacts their choice. And then putting things in the world that uh, hopefully, hopefully can have impact on them. I imagine there's a pretty uh, comprehensive discovery and research. I'd love to know a little bit your process for, I love that concept uh, you're talking about of designing choice. Um, what is what is some of the process that, where do you start companies when you're yeah. working through this? It's kind of a, a come at it from both ends perspective when we talk about that. The most obvious end is getting out and talking to consumers uh, about why they do it. But, you know, we can only get so far when we're just talking to consumers because, you know, they don't necessarily are not primed to tell us exactly why they make their choices. So we have to dig a little deeper. We do a lot of what we call choice audits where we take certain elements like price out of the equation and get people to understand what would cause them to choose certain brands over others when we eliminate certain things from the equation, it helps to isolate what are the true drivers and motivators there. Um, so what we do a lot of, uh, you know, what I would call kind of typical consumer research and a lot more organic consumer research where we're really trying to listen and understand because oftentimes those motivations, which are at the core of people's choices are a little more hidden than obvious. That's the, the kind of one side of the equation. The other side of the equation is we find it usually really helpful to dig into the DNA of our clients. And that means getting pretty intimate with the key stakeholders around the table, not only those in the marketing department. In fact, those are the ones that generally we have a pretty good idea of already, but getting into product development, getting into founders, getting into board members, um, you know, that can really be an effective way to understand what's unique about this brand, this company. Um, and so when we're trying to match up consumer motivations with how we're going to meet those as a brand in the marketplace, understanding the DNA of a client, what motivates them, what makes them unique, what makes them different, and how we might be able to package that in a way that's going to impact people's choices is kind of the, the kind of double angled approach that we, we kind of usually employ almost across the board. I kind of see you, I guess, as choice scientists. You're doing all these experiments to see what is working and what's not. So I'm curious, some of the surprising find findings. When you look back at some of the experiments you've done over the years, when you've eliminated certain things or add certain things, what sticks out as a finding that maybe surprised you? It reminds me of the book uh, Influence by Robert Cialdini, where they did a bunch of experiments, social experiments. I know um, Dan Ariely's book, Predictably Irrational. He also talks about different experiments that people are doing from in a social situation. Um, what are some that has stuck out that surprised you? Yeah, you know, I think what constantly surprises me is how much we believe rational decision-making design, de, you know, defines our choices and how little it actually does or how prominent emotion uh, and gut uh, are to making those actual choices and whether that's a choice to choose to buy a mobile phone, buy a car, uh, or donate to a particular charity. Um, you know, I think at, at the core, we, we 
Uh, you know, it's it's always, and I, it shouldn't surprise me anymore, Jeremy, but it does, um, that those emotional drivers are really the ones that affect choice. And the, the more rational, functional things often are our are, are rationalizations to justify the choice we made. Um, you know, and that's why some of the research, I love I love your term of choice scientists. Um, I might steal that from you. But it's all but yours. I do, I, yeah. Um, I do think, you know, you ask people why they buy something, um, and they're like, well, you know, why do why do you buy that beer? Well, I like the taste of it better. You know, if you do blind taste tests on beers, I, it, it's almost impossible people for people to tell the beer they drink. Like even hardcore beer drinkers get this wrong because we've worked in, in the, the Bev alcohol business for a while. Um, you know, we actually were working in a category where in the beer category for a while where people said they actually bought this beer because it's colder. And you're like, it's colder. And like, it was a brand perception that it was a refreshing, cold, crisp beer. <laughs> like, really are, I thought, put the other one in the refrigerator a little longer and then maybe. It's in the ice or the you know, so things like that, you know, um, again, people's default answer, you know, oh, I buy that one because it's the best price. Well, okay, well, price isn't out of the equation um, or, or we found a lower competitor. Well, well, why wouldn't you buy that one? Well, it's not the same. You know, so there's there's usually I think that's surprising. And again, maybe it shouldn't be is that there's almost always reasons beyond the first two or three reasons people give you on really what motivates their choice. What's an example? What's an example of where you've uncovered the what's the actual emotional driver behind something? You know what? Because uh, people don't consciously know this stuff like you probably have to peel the layers off. And they think, oh, it's on price. And you're like, no, it's this. No, it's this. And probably, the, like you said, the third or fourth or yeah. fifth thing down. What are What is an example of those emotional I mean, drivers? Yeah, you know, we, we started working with a, a mobile phone company um, a while back. It's called Kudo Mobile. And they are generally in the kind of lower tier price. They're called a flanker brand. Um you know, uh, not necessarily right at the, the lowest price possible, but definitely in the kind of value part of the equation. Um, you know, and as we talk, again, as we talk to many people, right, well, um, I make my decision based on the network, uh, the quality of the network, and I, uh, you know, base my decision based on price. You know, as we dug into why people chose this brand, it, it was all about the experience. It was, you know, and, and what we learned is customers of this brand loved it. And, and not because of the low price they were paying, because the community experience around it was really good to be able to find help. Uh, the ability to, you know, adjust your plan really easy. Um, you know, these, these kind of elements came to life that made the experience in a category where the experience is not really expected to be great. In fact, most people, you know, at best, their telco provider is like good if it doesn't mess up. And if the only time I have feelings towards it is negative if it screws up. You know, so the people who who use the Kudo brand, customers of this brand were static, but they rated it the number one brand in, in the entire mobile category. People who hadn't heard of this brand or didn't weren't customers but had heard of it, ranked it nearly the lowest brand. And so we realized, and yet the price was the same for everybody, you know, although the network was the same for everybody, but what was missing was the experience. And, and what we ended up doing with that was we created this, the, this kind of platform, you know, expressed as a tagline called Choose Happy. And the idea of Choose Happy was like, hey, you don't have to take a miserable telco experience. There is a happier option out there. Um, you know, you're seeing on the screen, you know, we then put that filter literally through everything that this organization does. And I'll give you one example, which is kind of interesting on how you play up, you know, this, this idea of choose happy. Um, they had this feature, like virtually every telco company does, that pauses the data when you start getting near to it. Uh, you know, it's it's a it's a commit commodity across everything, and and they actually our client was saying, hey, we could do something with this, but I'm not sure it's all that unique. And we thought, well, we we know we listen to people. Data overages, you know, 
and this was a couple of years ago. So data overages are a little bit more serious now that unlimited plans are, are everywhere. But data overages were a real pain in the ass. And this, this shock of this bill that, that people would get. So we thought, hey, if we could take this feature and spin it into a consumer benefit, i.e., you know, you're going to have a shock-free bill. Um, and that's how we launched this thing. It's called shock-free data and a surprise-free bill. And all of a sudden, we took that and made that that kind of commoditized feature with a filter of the emotional, hey, choose happy, and, and made it in from a feature into a benefit that created a better experience. And it was the number one reason that people chose the Kudo brand, led to great for the next two and a half years, led to tremendous growth in, the, in, in their brand and their subscription base. And it was, again, not a original feature that any other telco had. It was just packaged up to kind of promote the, the uniqueness of the experience uh, that the Kudo brand delivered. Yeah, I love that. You took one of the features and you you put it like there from your deep research, their emotional filter over it. Um, exactly. You know, you could take that. We did the same thing. They had a referral friend program. Referral friend programs exist all over the place. But also, you know, we, we asked our client to go through it. We're like, so? Happy experience, easy. Did you feel good about making the right? It was the UX on this thing was terrible and it made it difficult for people. We switched it up, wasn't all that uh, difficult to do. We switched it up, made it a lot easier for people to do, timed it to when people really feel like they wanna make references. And we had a 10X return on the amount of people referring people in the first year. It was this great uh, thing of, like, you know, again, instead of focusing necessarily on products and features, it's the benefits those can provide. And in this case, why it creates a happier experience in a category that generally is not known for delivering happy experiences. Yeah, what were some of those things that you remember helped with helping them 10X the referrals? You know what, ultimately it was a combination of a couple of things. First and foremost is making it easy. You know, people are lazy and, you know, they just don't want to work too hard. And yes, if you're giving me a, a, a bonus of some sort to refer a friend, I, I want the bonus, but I'm not willing to work too hard for it. So the first thing was making it easy to execute both on the giver's end and on the receiver's end. Like I got to make it. So, you know, a classic kind of user experience journey to make it really simple. The, the next thing is, and I, I mentioned this, is the timing of when you promote to clients um, or customers when, hey, you should, you should check out our refer friend program. And what we found was there is a period, you know, kind of from 30 to 90 days after they come on board where they're far more likely to refer. You know, they, they've experienced it. They're probably the difference from their previous provider is most ripe in their mind. They're kind of your biggest evangelist. And by promoting it in that time period, not before they experience or, you know, a year down the road when it's not kind of as top of mind with them really helped those. So those two things were the biggest differentiator. I mean, we, we experimented with different levels of, of awards for the referring person. And to be honest, that has an impact as well. But I would say those two things were the biggest drivers. Yeah. I mean, some of that would be, I think, a little counterintuitive. At least I've thought about it before. It's like, well, they just started. We don't want to bother them. Let's wait six months. And from the research, it's like, that's not going to work. You know, they're probably most excited. But I could see, and I've even thought this, well, we don't want to bother them. They're just starting. But that's when they're most excited too. Yeah. You know, you 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 buy a new pair of shoes, you really love them. And if you're like a basketball player like I am or a skier and you buy a new pair of skis and you, you, you go on them for a couple of weekends, you're like, oh, but you got to try these. They're so amazing. That's when you want to talk about stuff. And that's, you know, is, is even as, as something as, as kind of typical and every day as a cell phone plan, um, it still applies. We talked about in the very beginning how people market brands. I want to talk about some of the mistakes people make, but you created this video here. You guys yep. have such a creativity about you, and we'll so, show some of the other ones. How do you come to this where someone's on a trampoline? And by the way, if someone's listening to this on one of the audio channels, you can go. There's a video version, and we're I'm, I'm showing the Camp Jefferson site. And um, 
you know, you can see here this person is jumping on a trampoline. And I'm just wondering, how did you come up with this person with the Velcro suit jumping <laughs> onto this board? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it started with our kind of, uh, again, ways we're trying to make people happy and deliver on our promise to choose happy. One of the, the strategies was kind of like what you're saying, pick your perks. Ch you know, put another way, choose what makes you happy. And so we provided uh, customers um, the real opportunity to kind of going, hey, you know, not everyone has the same value to the same kind of functionality. I, I might like a speed boost. Some other people might like unlimited long distance plant, international plants. Other people might like rollover data. So we kind of went, well, instead of kind of giving them one option, I think it would make people happier if they had their option to choose. So there's where the strategy around pick your perks and choose what makes you happy. As far as the specific execution, you know, we've worked with our client to define, you know, what our brand personality is a lot. And, and we want to be kind of a fun, youthful, you know, brand in the marketplace. We also, Jeremy, we spend, uh, the Kudo brand spends considerably less money in media than the other big partners out there. So we have to do creative that kind of stands out. And to be honest, once we kind of got this idea of like, hey, we have 15 seconds to show people how we can pick your perk. Um, you know, what, how can we do that in a fun way? And, uh, and this idea and the, the giant claws that goes, that people were going down as a person. Yeah, the, that was a great one. You know, people having to pick your perk. We just kind of came up with, with a funny, hopefully unignorable way for people to understand what we were trying to communicate. Love it. I'm just always wondering what's happening around the boardroom where it goes like, yeah, let's get someone a trampoline and put them in a Velcro suit and have them jump onto a board. You know, like, yeah. it's, it's kind of the fun of being able to work in this business. When, seems like, so random. Discussion you have around the boardroom table. Yeah, exactly. And we'll talk about, you know, you do a lot of things as a company and you put out things in my mind that's a bit counterintuitive. Um, and I love that because it's not something I would think of. And we'll, we'll talk about the Walter Caesar one because this is one of my favorite sure. ones. So I encourage everyone to go campusjefferson.com and you can go to their um their work slash work and you can kind of see some of these but you can watch the full video uh here and we'll, we'll talk about this because this is again i would you think these are the ones that are getting cut like what we're going to show here are the clips that i would think 99 percent of companies would cut from a video and, yeah. and we, we'll we'll see why but talk about some of the mistakes people make when they're marketing their brands what have you seen you know what or maybe you have to correct the companies that come to you and you have to kind of educate them on yeah we're not going to do this because we've seen that done and that's not going to work yeah i think there's a couple things and this this caesar case will will bring some of these to life uh one is um kind of catering to the category tropes um, you know, and kind of going, oh, you know, this is why people enter the category. Um, so I'm just going to speak to those as well. Um, you know, reasons, the, there's a commenting marketing term called reasons to believe, you know, it's, hey, what's the proof points you have on why people should believe you and buy? And, and we kind of fundamentally think reasons to believe are, are a bit misguided, you know, they'll take you to the standard category reasons um, as opposed to reasons to choose and what is going to make them choose you over someone else. So I think a common mistake is kind of playing to the category tropes, playing to the, the things that people go to the category to get and are almost table stakes. And, and if you're just spending good money of, of your client's money out there promoting table stakes, you're not creating a lot of differentiation for you and you're not getting a great return on their, their thing, their, their, their investment. So I think that's one thing that people do. I think, you know, the other, the other thing that comes with that is generally you're not that differentiated. Like the, the differentiation quite literally drives growth. There was a great study and I, I can't remember the name off the top of my head, came out just a, a few months ago from Wark that showed that brands that have true differentiation will grow 25% uh, higher than brands that have limited to no differentiation. So being unique and being regarded as unique really matters. Uh, and certainly playing to the industry defaults is not gonna do that. The other thing I think that 
people will often mistaken is trying to go after everybody. Um, not defining who your audience is or who the potential person uh, you know you're you're trying to attract. And I don't mean by age or even other demographics. I mean by like this type of person um, is going to be interested in us. And 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 when we focus on that, it's going to give us a lot more creativity. It's going to get a lot more insight into be able to do something meaningful. Uh, and the the the, exa- the Walter Caesar example you have up there is a, a perfect one on that. So let's talk about this one for a second. Sure. If you're again, if you're listening here, there's a video here. We're looking at it. I'm not going to you know ruin the punchline here, but um, you know it is very in my mind, counterintuitive. So just talk about what's going on here. Sure. So basically what we did here was they are new entry to the market, Walter Caesar. They are competing against a giant who owns literally 90% of the market share in months. They needed to do something unique. Yeah. And Walter uh, Caesar is a, is a drink. Walter Caesar is a drink. Uh, for those in the States, it's like a Bloody Mary type drink. Uh, it's, it's up here in Canada. It's made with clam juice, um, really popular drink, but very polarizing. People love it or people hate it. And when I was referring to audience profile, we were not going to go out there. We had literally, I would say maybe one fiftieth of the budget of Mott's to take tackle this. So we need, we're not going to go out there and convince people who don't like Caesars as a drink to go and drink one. We're going to try and take share from you know people who are drinking Caesars and come drink ours. And the, the thing about this product it was it was really authentic. It was great. It was a good quality, authentic Caesar. So once we decided on that audience, all of a sudden it made things really, really uh, much more opened up new avenues. And what we did because we we played off the insight that Caesars are so polarizing. And what we created, what was we referred to as the detestimonial, and that if polar Caesars are so polarizing, and we're a real authentic Caesars, then people who don't like Caesars will particularly hate us. They will hate us even more than they hate others because we're a true, real Caesar. And so we convinced the client, uh, and I give a client a ton of credit; they had a lot of trust that we could pull this off, that we would show people hating their product, detesting their product, swearing after they took a sip of their product, showing terrible faces to prove just how genuine our Caesar was and that we were a product that, as you can see, was made for Caesar lovers. So if you love Caesars, you're really going to love this drink. And again, those principles of not playing off the industry tropes and understanding of your audience really comes to light on being able to do do products that really show people hating it to show just how authentic it truly is. And for a Caesar lover, that's exactly what they're looking for. It was tremendously successful for them, low budget, and just immediately shot them to the top. They were number one fastest drink that summer. Let's talk about trust for a second. Anyone who runs yeah. an agency, your clients are coming to you for your expertise, but but still they have opinions. And how do you get that them to how do you get a client to agree to this i mean like hey client we're gonna show videos of people hating your products (laughs) and multiple things they're gonna make bad faces they're gonna say it's gross and you you got approval to actually um follow through with this so yeah yeah how do you get the client to agree it, it, you know, it is, it is really based on trust. And like Peter, um, we, we got, those. we hired you to make us look good. And this is what you show us. Like I can yeah, see this going yeah. south quickly. You can imagine the presentation. Well, I, I will say that the, the thing that's maybe a bit uh, misunderstood about our industry, you know, uh, we, we don't generally go away and just come back and go, Hey, we got it. You know, it's like in one fell swoop. So we worked with these guys uh, a on this strategy of kind of going, hey, if, if if we're authentic, how can we separate ourselves from this? What is going to make us unique? We want to go after Caesar lovers. We have a right to win with them more than anyone else. Um, 
you know, and then there was the big loop to kind of going, okay, a great way to show that we're authentic is to show how Caesar, how much Caesar lovers or people who don't like Caesars hate us. And that was loop. And I, they, they really bought off on the strategy when we showed them the creative, the, the biggest question, this is where trust came in was, can we do it so that the net takeaway, even though we're showing people not liking our product and D testimonials, as we've referred to it, can the net takeaway be to our, to our, the people we care about, this is going to be a real authentic, good Caesar, you know, and, and as the line for Caesar lovers, you know, and, and that took a bit of a leap of faith on their part, but relationships, you know, having previous success. And, and again, knowing that we are in it and, and the, you know, unfortunately this isn't the case for all advertising agencies because sometimes advertising agencies just want to do crazy work uh, for the sake of doing crazy work. And I think, you know, the key to building that trust is we're here to grow your business and we fundamentally believe and have real good strategic insight to show that this is going to do that. It's it's a bit risky for sure, but we've mitigated the risk with a lot of the research and understanding we do. And, and uh, you know, you, you need something to stand out because you're not going to be able to outspend and you're not going to be able to kind of out market. So you got to be smarter. And I think those combinations came for this client, but we have many clients who, you know, put that trust in us as their partner, because we know, they know we have their, their interests at heart. Uh, in fact, you know, to be very transparent with many of our clients, our theory, fee agreements are actually um, set up so that we win when they win. Um, we don't, we don't necessarily just get paid for hours. We get paid on results. And uh, those also help because we're all vested in the same outcomes. I could see Peter, how the D testimonial can work in a number of different types of companies, not just this, because someone's thinking, well, they have a weird, uh, you know, a different brand, or maybe it tastes funny or whatever. But I, this could work, I think, if you you focus on the people you don't want to attract and highlight those things and create a D testimonial out of it. I'm wondering if you've if you've used it or seen other examples. I could see this in kombucha companies. I mean, I love kombucha actually, yeah. but I could see that working in that, not just drink categories, but just highlighting, you know, we don't want, even in a car company, like someone's talking about all the features, why they hate of it. Whereas someone who wants those features, it, it speaks to them. I, I think it's a really interesting strategy when there's a polarization in the, in the product that, that for the same reason, People love it and people hate it. You know, like you might kind of go, um, this bed is too, is very, very soft. And for that exact reason, people love it. And for that exact same reason, people hate it. And those are the types of scenarios where that idea of, of like the testimony or, or showing, because it's that same feature that people hate that causes people to like it. And, uh, and if your audience is just going over the people that already like soft beds, then you're probably in a good place. Yeah. Um, you know, when I was doing research, um, I was reading, you really also, one of the things you focused in on was client relations and growth. So for a company, what are some of the things that you think about or are instructive for someone when you are talking to someone from another company and say, hey, here's how we think about client relations? Yeah. Um, it, it's such a great question is to be honest, I, I think our number one reason for growth, to be very honest, is our relationships with clients. And I think it starts with empathy uh, in, you know, being truly understand what they're the position they're in, what uh, they're they're being measured against. Um, you know, we we often push clients, oh, you know, don't worry, it, it's risk, but it'll be great. And I think we're, you know, we we have to put ourselves in their shoes in a very empathetic and sympathetic way to understand, you know, these are potentially their their jobs at risk. You know, if they big a big investment out there and it doesn't work, you know, it's not just, hey, that campaign didn't work. It's like, okay, I'm looking for a new job now. So I think really it starts with that. And and what flows from that is treating and, and having the passion for their business as if it's our own. 
And, you know, so that requires a, us being, you know, digging in, being as knowledgeable on that. But it also just, it, it has that ability, like, you know, we can, we can bring in a fresh voice. We can bring in the voice of the consumer. We can bring in an outside perspective. But at the same time, we need to understand the world that they're, they're operating in. And, and if we do that well, we, we together can take leaps because they know we're not pushing them into unnecessarily prices for, for just for the sake of doing something outlandish or risky, that we're doing it for the right reasons and because we truly believe it. So I, I think that's it. I think the other piece that really builds that relationship is collaboration and transparency. You know, um, unfortunately, in our industry, there is, you know, kind of an, an adage where we you get the brief from the client and you go away from three weeks and you come back and you go, ta-da, here it is. We've cracked it and it's right. And you we really hope you go ahead with this. Um, I don't think that's the best way to build relationships. I think working together, sharing early, sharing often, exploring areas together, um, those are the things that, you know, help us to understand how they think and that helps them understand what we think. And then together we are better for it. Um, but it takes, you, you mentioned trust earlier, Jeremy, and it, and it really takes, it both takes trust and leads to trust when, when you get it right. Yeah, I love that. Uh, empathy, collaboration, transparency, and it kind of goes back to the foundation. The foundation is you have to have staff that have empathy, right? So Talk about the hiring process. Yeah, you're right. Uh, in our industry, our people are our product. Our ideas that come from the people is what we sell. Is that you know? So um, bringing in the right type of people um, is absolutely crucial. And we have a pretty um, there's a there's a few kind of principles or tenets about Camp Jefferson that we are fairly adamant uh, about doing. And and again, you mentioned one, uh, being able to have empathy. Um, kind of on the flip side of that is, you know, no egos. Um, egos tend to get in the way of, of empathy uh, really quickly. So in, in our business, there's no, no lack of egos. And, and we really pride ourselves on finding people who don't. Uh, I think, again, a collaborative spirit. Um, we have we have different groups within the agency as as any kind of company does. We have strategy folks and creative folks and production folks, project management folks. Um, but the realization that you know anyone and everyone is contributing to making the idea great um, is really important. Um, having each other's back that it's not my role and over to you and that no kind of passing of the baton. Those are some of the tenants um, that really really drive us. You know, and we're in a social, fun business. You know, I think, you know, having people who um, we definitely don't look for a single prototype, but having people who can get along and and work together, bring diverse and unique perspectives and feel very kind of comfortable doing so. Um, that's really the key to our success here. And then we have to fuel that with a culture that accepts that and and that allows people the freedom, the flexibility to be themselves, uh, both in their lifestyle, but in, in how they work. Um, and, you know, and interestingly, uh, you know, we have a, our, our approach to training and even rewards is to think about kind of the whole person and, and not just the person you are at work, because, you know, we do take up a lot of your time, but if we think about you more holistically, and, and how we can help, like in our training programs, to not just, you know, give you the obvious training, um, but but kind of help you expand and in, in where you're going. It can be a really a win-win for both of us, for the person, and then ultimately better. You know, I'll, I'll maybe give you a quick example of that, Jeremy. We did a training program where we, we took the entire agency for a day, and we brought in this um, former FBI director who, who was leading a, a, a practitioner in cold cases. And, and the day we spent trying to crack actually a real existing cold case, he gave us all the material, all the research, all the investigation that's been done. And, it, you know, it may seem quite tangential to an agency and, and to some degree it was, but it was a great day. But what it really was interesting is it actually ended up having a lot of great impacts because trying to dig through 
you know, a puzzle, fit the pieces together. What could have been happening? What were the money? It was a, it was a fantastic day, but it like probably one of our most, you know, well revered and, and the feedback we got uh, as far as a training day goes, but it was kind of on a, a, on a unique perspective. And I think th that approach to the kind of thinking about people as people, not just employees has really helped us um, not only in finding the right type of people, but in helping them grow. I love that. What about the, on the reward side? Yeah. What are some things that you think about that are maybe unique rewards? Um, Cause it sounds like it's very kind of individualized. Yeah. Well, there's a couple of things. I mean, um, you know, not everyone is is driven by a bigger paycheck or, or more money. Most people appreciate that. Let's be very honest. But also our, our resources, you know, are not infinite when it comes to just giving out raises and, and, and such. So I think understanding what, again, what drives people's and what motivates people. You know, sometimes it's more more days off. Sometimes it is the ability to do unique training programs that maybe they would never get a chance to do. I mean, another example is how we've structured our work week. So we're a very collaborative business. So we do get together for a couple of days a week in the office, Wednesdays and Thursdays. But we quite purposefully, you know, um, schedule our other days to allow people greater freedoms. And in fact, we have this program, it's called Full Flex Fridays, where we try and eliminate the use of emails, meetings, uh, and get togethers on Fridays so that people can use that day for what they feel the best purpose is. Sometimes that's catching up on work. Sometimes it's just sitting down and having dedicated uninterrupted work time, which people tremendously value. And sometimes it's, you know, hey, I'm in a good place. I'm going to start my weekend a little early, you know, but having that ability to allow people, um, you know, the freedom to kind of determine their schedule, you know, and it starts with, you know, having real confidence in people. And if you hire people you trust and feel are good people, you can give them that latitude because, you know, it's going to return, you know, and then some. What's um, something that's baked in the hiring process that you find valuable? Like I know I was talking to someone the other day, they use, uh, I mean, companies use different tools. They specifically use predictive index. They like it. I know others have used culture index. Others use Colby. Others have used different tests. But aside from that, what is something that's kind of baked into the hiring process to help you to actually, because I'm sure a lot of people, when they when you put out something, a lot of people apply and you have to weed out people. So yeah. what what's something that you do? I, I You know, this is, I wish it was cooler. Um, but probably our biggest key to success is having them meet more people across the agency um, and not just within their kind of discipline. So, hey, I'm a project manager. Well, don't just meet your project manager boss. Um, meet some creative people. Meet some strategists. Um, start to get a feel. You know, and what's interesting, Jeremy, is not only do we get a good sense of that person and, and what they're going to be like, and um, but they get a better sense of us. And, and I think that is what sometimes is forgotten when you're looking at people is that it's as much about the fit, that person fitting in your culture and bringing value and diversity into your culture as it is about you know, the other way around. And, and I think um, exposing them to who we are, how we think and how we work and letting them make a, a good judgment on, is this the right kind of place for me? You know. We are, we're not the biggest agency in Canada. In fact, we're kind of a mid-sized agency. There are a lot bigger places with bigger headcounts and stuff that they can go to, but um, there's something about us that is really appealing to a lot of people. And if, and if it works for you, then it's probably going to work for us. So it's a kind of a, a more of a two-way um, street on that. So not that rocket science or any cool tool, but uh, really that exposure we find really helps. I was reading... Uh, you know, Peter, with um, about employee engagement in your company mm -hmm. that, you know, um, I'm not sure what's at today, but at the time when I was reading it, employee engagement at over 86%. Um, yep. Talk about what that means and what are the things that you do as a company to foster employee engagement? Yeah, it, you know, it, it is, uh, thankfully, I think we're at 88 this year, so we went up a couple of bit um, from from your research, but yeah, it's, it's um, 
you know, again, it, it comes back to that principle I mentioned before about thinking of the person as a whole person. Um, so what can we do to make your work life more enjoyable, uh, more motivating, allow you greater growth, but also what are you, what's the person you are out of work and how can we, you know, make sure that what we're asking of you and what you're bringing fits in with that. I think there's the other thing and, you know, this, this stems from our, I think our leadership re team right down is, is a feeling of team. Uh, and I'll give you an example. We, um, a couple examples. We had one in our history. We've had one. We had one really, really challenging client. We brought them on. New business working great. Said all the right things. Uh, a few months in the relationship, it's getting pretty difficult. And at, at one point, the relationship got to a point where it's, it's really tough. And a couple of people are getting quite upset um, from these interactions. You know, and, and we stood up for as a management team. We decided in my first time in my 20 year career, we actually fired a client. We said, you know what, this isn't working for us. And although we, you know, we appreciate the revenue and all that stuff, it's not working. And uh, standing up for our clients, uh, for our employees in that matter, uh, it really shows that we have their back. Um, and a similar situation when COVID hit, a lot of our clients' budgets, you know, came back and, and, and many agencies had to lay off many people. Um, our management team took a pay cut uh, for quite a bit of time so that we didn't have to lay off a single person. And we did that because not only did we just think it's just not the right thing to do at this point in time to lay off people who are going to have no hope of finding a job, but we also did it kind of going, this too will pass. And we want to be in a strong position to come out of this. Uh, and I can tell you, our growth coming out of the out of the pandemic was was really phenomenal. Twenty plus growth coming out of the the pandemic, and seventy six percent of that was with our original clients, organic growth. And I we would have never been able to achieve that had we you know had to retool the team and rehire the team. So while it it kind of sounds like a very you know a very generous approach to make, it also it was good for our people but it was also good for us and the two need not be independent. Yeah. I want to, uh, I have one last question for you, sure. Peter, um, before I ask it, I just want to point people to check out and learn more. You can go to campjefferson.com. Um, they work with some amazing companies. They have some great examples of just their thought process. Um, I know you do, you have some on the center for addiction and mental health, the cam H um, there's some videos and information on that. And we already point out a few other ones um, on their work page. So I just encourage everyone to check those out. And the Walter Caesar one's hilarious. So you should definitely uh, watch that one. My last question is just um, about mentors um, in the industry, your mentors, uh, people you've learned from throughout the years, some of the lessons uh, you learned from them in, in your business. You know, it, uh, it, it's a great question. And, you know, we're in such a people oriented business that I think, um, mentorship is really important, you know, and, and, and as a bit of a side note, like it was, it's interesting when we were all working from home due to the pandemic and COVID, I think that's the one piece, you know, that really kind of probably suffered the most. Um, we were able to give guidance and direction. Um, that's no problem, but the true mentorship takes connectivity and takes being there. And uh, it's a really important one. I, I know for me, and it, it's, it's funny, I was, I was just sharing this, um, this perspective of some advice, you know, a mentor of mine gave me, and it would literally be 12 years ago or more, it, you know, and, and it stuck with me. And it, it was about, you know, how to present yourself. I'm a fairly opinionated person and usually kind of have quick to make decisions. And, and the, you know, the advice was, you know, listen and, 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 and contemplate before you come in and, and those sorts of advice, those pieces of advice can stick with you. And, and I think the beauty of, uh, in, you know, this is a personal bias, but a beauty of a kind of a mid-sized place is you have far more interactions. You have far more ability to get exposed to people who have been through something, have seen something, not just your direct boss or manager. Uh, and I think that for allows for kind of the softer side of mentoring and uh, it's a huge piece of it. We we set up very, you know, deliberate programs to cross pollinate mentors. But I actually think the soft side of mentorship 
of being with people, seeing them in action, that, that, that little comment at the end of a presentation of, hey, this was really great, or you know, if you had done a little more of that, I think those are the little pieces that tend to stick with people a little longer and make impact. Peter, I want to be the first one to thank you. Everyone check out more episodes of the podcast. Check out campjefferson.com, and we'll see you next time. Peter, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. It was a real pleasure. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sailing right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.